About a year ago, I made a video called Orchestral Fundamentals, Instruments and Their Roles, as pictured right there. Now this video was about the orchestra, very fundamental video, um, each section. We talked about the uh, woodwind section, the brass section and the string section, how they worked uh, and their roles, Okay, what their purposes were. Um, and I happened to hint at the percussion section, not really expecting to make a video on that particular section because... Well, it was a new channel. I didn't know how many views that video was going to get, but to my surprise, it got 15,000 views, which is orders of magnitude more popular than any other video I've ever put in this channel. Um, for comparison's sake, my videos typically get like just under 100 views, about 100 views thereabouts. So 15,000 views is like ridiculous, right? In grand scheme, we think it's a drop in the ocean. I understand that. But for me, it was quite something. And a couple of comments were that were left on that video alluded to the fact that, like I'd mentioned the uh, percussion section, when am I going to make that video? Well, this is that video. So without any further preamble, let's dive right in. The first thing to understand about percussion is that there are two kinds. We've got pitched and unpitched. Now, when we talk about something being unpitched, we don't mean that it has no pitch. Uh, technically, every type of percussion produces a tone. I mean, if I slap my desk, it produces a sound. Now, that sound can be measured. In other words, we can calculate its frequency. If something has a frequency, it has a pitch, right? So when we talk about unpitched percussion, we're not saying that they don't have a pitch. They do. The difference between pitch and unpitched is how that pitch is used. So pitched percussion, the way to think of it is it's used to produce melody. That's sort of its primary focus. You can't really do that with unpitched percussion. At least that's not really its purpose. So let's have a look at some examples. In terms of unpitched percussion, from an orchestral point of view, we've got a bass drum, snare drum, cymbals, and triangles. From a marching point of view, you've got tenor drums. Now, you might be thinking that that couldn't that fall into pitched percussion because they've got so many. I mean, marching drummers these days, they carry six drums on their harness. But no, it is still considered unpitched percussion. And from a, a traditional side of things, you've got bongos, congas, and djembe drums. All of these are unpitched percussion. They are typically tuned to one pitch, and that's where they will stay for the duration of a performance. Moving on to pitched percussion, we've got the timpani, the marimba, vibraphone, xylophone, glockenspiel, tubular bells. These are all forms of pitched percussion. The timpani, by the way, is interesting. Uh, the, Typically, you have four drums, and each drum has a pedal. And I can use that pedal to either um, add tension to a skin or remove tension from a skin, thereby adjusting the pitch. Marimbas, vibraphones, xylophones, glockenspiels, tubular bells all use hammers. Um, now, that being said, I want to quickly look at some sheet music so we can explore how this stuff is notated, just to really sort of drive this point home of pitched versus unpitched. So as you can see, our pitched percussion is a staff, very similar to any other instrument you might find in the orchestra. Um, interestingly enough, some of these percussion in, in instruments have a single staff, and some of them have a double staff. This is a um, grand staff, right? The marimba, because you can actually play marimba with four mallets, so it gets a double staff. Uh, timpani has a bass staff because it's a lower sounding drum, a bass clef, I should say, and then glockenspiel has a higher clef, the treble clef because it's a very high pitched um, instrument. In fact, let's have a listen to it, shall we? And then the timpani, so that you can hear that it's a much deeper sound. Right? It's also a much louder drum, because of course it is. Now moving down to unpitched, you'll notice there's only one line, and that's because you don't need any pitch information. We need to know things like dynamics, we need to know articulation, we need timing and information, timing and rhythm information, but the one thing we don't need is pitch. A bass drum is tuned to whatever it's tuned to. You're not going to be adjusting that during a 
performance. Same goes for a snare drum, some, same goes for a triangle. Incidentally, you do get different sizes of triangles. That is actually a thing that, that, that occurs. You also get different um, sizes of snare drums. It can be tuned to different pitches also. And bass drums also come in different sizes. Uh, but again, typically, these are just single notes. I don't know if the bass drum played, but hopefully. Let's maybe put that in there to see if we can get it to... It's just very quiet, I think. All right, any case, now that we understand pitched versus unpitched, we can get into the three roles of percussion. This, by the way, is why our percussion is a separate video, because the other sections, we didn't have to go through all that preamble. You could just dive straight in. But with percussion, we need to understand the difference between pitched and un unpitched. So that being said, I'm going to load up my software so I can show you my examples here. All right, the first role is melody. Now, to be clear, this, of course, only applies to pitched uh, percussion. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, unpitched, like we've been saying, can't really produce melodies. But essentially what this is, is um, sometimes a percussion instrument is used to play the main melody line, otherwise a counter melody of some kind. So this is just an example to demonstrate that I composed. Uh, nothing fancy, but uh, let's see what it sounds like. Now, you'll notice we've got two uh, marimbas playing and a xylophone, but we've got a string section also. So strings in this case are just providing some extra um, body to the piece of ambience, feels, but the melody is being played by the percussion, right? The percussion section is playing melody, right? Uh, this timpani doesn't need to be here, or the uh, woodwind section, we didn't use that. But yeah, so this is the first role is a melody, nice and simple. The second role that exists is rhythm. Now, that might seem a bit uh, redundant to say, I mean, we are talking about the percussion section, but I don't mean necessarily just in terms of beat here. We mentioned rhythm in the previous video uh, when we talked about the string section, um, I think I think the example we used was uh, double basses playing uh, eighth notes, triplets, uh, and that provided a good feel of uh, rhythm for the piece. It's a similar concept here. I've got, uh, you'll notice, two bass drums playing. Um, there's a brass section and a string section, and let's have a listen to what that sounds like. I was actually quite proud of that piece, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, that being said, let's move on to the third role that exists. Now the third role, the best word that I can come up with to describe this third role is punctuation. This isn't really a, 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 a musical term, per se. It's just to me gets the a message across properly. And the way that works, so to explain this, I have a woodwind section, brass and strings, and very little um, percussion here, because the percussion, it's almost going to be like seasoning. It's punctuating certain things. So if, as an example, at the start of a phrase, we could put a bass drum in just to punctuate the start of that phrase. Hopefully it's, it's uh, audible. And at the end of a phrase to punctuate it, we could put a crash and emphasize that crash with a timpani. I personally find it good practice, by the way, if I'm going to have a crash at the end to have a timpani or a bass drum, just to give that bass end, that uh, low end, um, really helps to, to, to sell that crash. So yeah, punctuation, to use it, like I say, a crash, every now and again to really give some more impact to that final chord. That being said, 
I want to give just a couple more notes, uh, final thoughts about uh, percussion section. The percussion section uh, for a lot of us composers, if we are to be completely honest about this, um, either is something that we sort of don't really think about until right at the end, like we finished composing the piece. You know what, I may as well add in some percussion, let's put some things in here and there. And you can do that, but I feel like percussion deserves more focus than that. Percussion is not an afterthought. You know, it's, it's an important part of the, the uh, on ensemble and should be treated as such. Other thing is, again, let's be honest here, we tend to not really think about the musicians behind the stuff. And there's two notes I can make there. Firstly, percussion's difficult, right? But don't get me wrong, violin is hard to play, Intonation is really difficult because there's no frets, so you kind of have to get used to knowing where to play those notes. But it's one instrument, whereas your percussionist had to learn all sorts of different things, right? They had to learn marimba, xylophone, timpani. I mean, all these different percussion instruments that exist. Some of them are pitched, some of them are unpitched. There are percussionists out there that have learned 14, 15 to 20 different percussion instruments to be able to play um professionally, whereas your violinist only had to learn one instrument, right? I'm not saying violin isn't difficult, it is, but it's still just one instrument, right? <laughs> um, yeah, the other thing is, let's be careful how we note, notate stuff. <clears throat> um, there's a tendency, for instance, to, especially when you're using um, percussion as punctuation, for instance, you might only use percussion right near the end of your piece, in which case you now have to write in that your uh, percussionist must wait like, I don't know, 48 bars or something. He's got to sit there and count bars. Let's remember to write in those leading bars so that the uh, percussionist has something to listen for. Let's try and make our percussionist's life a little easier is all I'm, I'm saying. Well, that's my final thoughts. <clears throat> I hope this video has been uh, useful to you. It's a bit of a sh much shorter one than the first video. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, and I guess I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>